Mahaparnibbana Siddhi The Great Passing The Buddha's Last Days This have I heard. Once the Lord was staying at Rajaga on the mountain called Walter's Peak. Now just then the King Ajahsattu Vede Hiputta of Magadha who wanted to attack the Vajans. He said, I will strike the Vajans who are so powerful and strong. I will cut them off and destroy them. I will bring them to ruin and destruction. And King Ajahsattu said to his chief minister, the Brahmin Vesakara, Brahmin, go to the Blessed Lord, worship him with your head to his feet in my name. Ask if he is free from sickness or disease. If he is living at ease, vigorously and comfortably. And then say, Lord, King Ajahsattu Veda Hiput of Magadha wishes to attack the Vajans and says, I will strike the Vajans who are so powerful and strong. I will cut them off and destroy them. I will bring them to ruin and destruction. And whatever the Lord declares to you, report that faithfully back to me. For Tathagatas never lie. Very good, sir, said the Vasakava, and having had the state courageous harnessed, he mounted one of them and drove in state from Vajagaha to Valjaspi, riding as far as the ground would allow, then continuing on the foot where the Lord was. He exchanged courtesies with the Lord and then sat down to one side and delivered the king's message. Now the venerable Ananda was standing behind the Lord, fanning him. And the Lord said, Ananda, have you heard that the Vajans hold regular and frequent assemblies? I have heard, Lord, that they do. Ananda, as long as Vajans hold regular and frequent assemblies, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. Have you heard that the Vajans meet in harmony, break up in harmony and carry on their business in harmony? I have heard, Lord that they do. Anand, as long as the Vajans meet in harmony, break up in harmony and carry on their business in harmony, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. Have you heard that the Vajans do not authorize what has not been authorized already and do not abolish what has been authorized, but proceed according to what has been authorized by their ancient traditions? I have heard, Lord. Have you heard that they honor, respect, revere and salute the elders among them and consider them with worth listening to? That they don't forcibly abduct others' wives and daughters and compel them to live with them? That they honor, respect, revere and salute the virgin shrines at home and abroad? Not withdrawing the proper support made and given before? that proper provision is made for the safety of Arahants, so that such Arahants may come in future to live there, and those already there may dwell in comfort? I have heard, Lord. Anand, so long as such proper provision is made for the safety of Arahants, so that such Arahants may come in future to live there, and those already there may dwell in comfort. The virgins may be expected to prosper and not decline. Then the Lord said to the Brahmin Vesakar, once Brahmin, when I was at the Saranda the shrine at Vesali, I told the virgins these seven principles for preventing decline, and as long as they keep these seven principles, as long as these principles remain in force, the virgins may be expected to prosper and not decline. At this Vasaka replied, Reverend Gautama, if the Vajans keep to even one of these principles, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. Far less all seven. Certainly the Vajans will never be conquered by King Ajasattu, by force of arms, but only by means of propaganda and setting them against one another. And now, Reverend Gautama, may I depart? I am busy and have much to do. Brahmin, do as you think fit. Then Vasakava, rejoicing and delighted at the Lord's words, rose from his seat and departed. Soon after Vasakara had gone, the Lord said, Anand, go to wherever monks there are around about Rajagaha 
and summoned them to the assembly hall. Very good, Lord, said Ananda, and did so. Then he came to the Lord, saluted him, stood to one side and said, Lord, the order of the monks is assembled. Now is the time for the Lord to do as he sees fit. Then the Lord rose from his seat, went to the assembly hall, sat down in the prepared seat and said, Monks, I will teach you seven things that are conducive to welfare. Listen, pay careful attention and I will speak. Yes, Lord, said the monks and the Lord said, As long as monks hold regular and frequent assemblies, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. As long as they meet in harmony, break up in harmony and carry on their business in harmony, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. As long as they don't authorize what has not been authorized already and don't abolish what has been authorized but proceed according to what has been authorized by the rules of training. As long as the honor, respect, revere and salute the elders of long standing who are long ordained, fathers and leaders of the order, as long as they don't fall free to desires which arise in them and lead to rebirth, as long as they are devoted to forest lodgings, as long as they preserve their personal mindfulness, so that in future the good among their companions will come to them and those who have already come will feel at ease with them. As long as the monks hold these seven things and are seen to do so, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. I will tell you another seven things conducive to welfare. As long as monks don't rejoice, delight and become absorbed in work, in chattering, in sleeping, in company, in evil desires, in mixing and associating with evil friends, as long as they don't rest content with partial achievements, as long as monks hold to these seven things and are seen to do so, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. I will tell you another seven things conducive to welfare. As long as monks continue with faith, with modesty, with fear of doing wrong, with learning, with aroused vigor, with established mindfulness, with wisdom, as long as the monks hold to these seven things and are seen to do so, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. I will tell you another seven things. As long as monks develop the enlightenment factors of mindfulness, of investigation of phenomena, of energy, of delight, of tranquility, of concentration, of equanimity, as long as the monks hold to these seven things, and are seen to do so, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. I will tell you another seven things. As long as monks develop the perception of impermanence, of non-self, of impurity, of danger, of overcoming, of dispassion, of cessation, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. Monks I will tell you six things that are conducive to communal living. As long as monks both in public and in private show loving kindness to their fellows in act of body, speech and thought, share with their virtuous fellows whatever they receive as a rightful gift, including the contents of their alms bowls, which they do not keep to themselves, keep consistently, unbroken, and unalter those rules of conduct that are spotless, leading to liberation, praised by the wise, unstained and conducive to concentration, and persist therein with their fellows, both in public and private, continues in the noble view that leads to liberation, to the utter destruction of suffering, remaining in such awareness with their fellows, both in public and private. As long as monks hold to these six things and are seen to do so, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. And then the Lord, while staying at Walter's feet, gave comprehensive discourse. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom. Concentration, when imbued with morality, bring great fruit and profit. Wisdom, when imbued with concentration, 
bring great fruit and profit. The mind imbued with wisdom becomes completely free from the corruptions. That is, from the corruption is sensuality of becoming of false views and of ignorance. And when the Lord has stayed at Rajgaha as long as he wished, he said to the venerable Ananda, Come Ananda, let's go to Ambatika. Very good Lord, said Ananda. And the Lord went there with a large company of monks. And the Lord stayed in the royal park of Ambatika, and there he delivered a comprehensive discourse. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom. Having stayed at Abantika as long as he wished, the Lord said to Ananda, Let's go to Nalanda. And they did so. At Nalanda, the Lord stayed in Pavarikas mango grove. Then the venerable Sariputta came to see the Lord, saluted him, sat down to one side and said, It is clear to me, Lord, that there never has been, will be or is now another ascetic of Rahmin who is better or more enlightened than the Lord. You have spoken boldly with the bull's voice, Sariputta. You have rovered the lion's rover of certainty. How is this? Have all the Arahan Buddhas of the past appeared to you and were in minds of all those lords open to you? So as to say, these lords were such virtue, such was their teaching, such their wisdom, such their way, such their liberation. No, Lord. And have you pursued all of Arhan Buddhas who will appear in the future? No, Lord. Well then, Sariputta, you know me as the Arhan Buddha, and do you know the Lord is of a such a virtue, such is his teaching, such his wisdom, such his way, such his liberation? No, Lord. So, Sariputta, you don't have knowledge of the minds of the Buddha of the past the future or the present. The Sariputta, have you not spoken boldly with the bull's voice and roared the lion's robber of certainty with your declaration? Lord, the minds of the Arahant Buddha of the past, future and the present are not open to me, but I know the drift of the Dhamma. Lord, it as if there were a royal frontier city with mighty bastions and a mighty encircling wall in which was a single gate, at which was a gatekeeper, wise, skilled and clever, who kept out strangers and let in those he knew, and he, constantly patrolling and following along a path, might not see the joints and clefts of the bastions even such a cat might creep through. For whatever larger creatures entered or left the city, must all go through this very gate. And it seems to me, Lord, that the drift of the Dhamma is the same. All those Arahant Buddhas of the past attain to supreme enlightenment by abandoning the five hindrances, defilements of mind, that weaken understanding, having firmly established the four foundations of mindfulness in their minds, and realize the seven factors of enlightenment as they really are. All the Arahan Buddhas of the future will do likewise, and you, Lord, who are now the Arahan, fully enlightened Buddha, have done the same. Then, while staying at Nalanda, in Pawarika's mango grove, the Lord gave comprehensive discourse to the monks. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom. And having stayed at Nalanda as long as he wished, the Lord said to Ananda, Let's go to Pataligama. And they did so. At Pataligama, they heard say, The Lord has arrived here. And the lay followers of Pataligama came to the Lord, saluted him, sat down to one side, and said, May the Lord consent to stay at our rest house. And the Lord consented by silence. Understanding his consent, they rose from their seats, saluted the Lord, and passing him by to the right went to the rest house and strewed the floor, prepared seats, provided a water pot and filled that oil lamp. Then they went to the Lord, saluted him, stood to one side and said, All is ready at the rest house. Lord, now is the time to do as the Lord wishes. Then the Lord rest, took his robe and bowl, 
and went with his monks to the rest house, where he washed his feet, went in and sat down facing east, with his back against the central pillar. And the monks, having washed their feet, went in and sat down their backs to the west wall, facing east, and with the Lord sitting in front of them. And the lay followers of Artly Gama, having washed their feet, went in and sat down with their backs to the east wall, facing west, and with the Lord before them. Then the Lord addressed the lay followers of Artly Gama, Householders, there are these five perils, to one of bad morality or failure in morality. What are they? In the first place, he suffers great loss of property through neglecting his affairs. In the second place, he gets a bad reputation for immorality and misconduct. In the third place, whatever assembly he approaches, whether of Kathias, Brahmins, householders or ascetics, he does so differently and shyly. In the fourth place, he dies confused. In the fifth place, after death, at the breaking up of the body, he arises in an evil state, a bad fate, in suffering in hell. There are these five perils to one of bad morality. And householders, there are these five advantages of one of the good morality of success in morality. What are they? In the first place, through careful attention to his affairs, he gains such wealth. In the second place, he gets a good reputation for morality and good conduct. In the third place, whatever assembly he approaches, whether of Kathias, Brahmins, householders or ascetics, he does so with confidence and assurance. In the fourth place, he dies unconfused. In the fifth place, after death, at the breaking up of the body, he arises in a good place, a heavenly world. These are five advantages of one of good morality and of success in morality. Then the Lord instructed, inspired, fired and delighted the lay followers of Patali Kama with talk on Dhamma until far into the night. Then he dismissed them, saying, Householders, the night is nearly over. Now it's time for you to do as you think fit. Very good, Lord. They said, and rising and saluting the Lord, they passed him by to the right and departed. And the Lord spent the remainder of the night in the rest house, left empty by their departure. Now at this time, Sunida and Vesakar, the Magad ministers, were building a fortress in the part Ligama as a defense against the Vajans. And at the time, a multitude of thousands of Devas were taking up lodging in part Ligama. And in parts where powerful Devas settled, they caused the mind of the most powerful royal officials to pick those sites for their dwelling and where middle and lower rank in Devas settled, so too they caused the minds of royal officials of a corresponding grade to pick those sites for their dwellings. And the Lord, with his divine eyes surpassing that of humans, so the thousands of Devas taking residence in the partly Gama, and getting up at break of day, he said to the venerable Ananda, Ananda, who is building a fortress at partly Gama? Lord, Sunid and Vesakar, the Magadan ministers, are building a fortress against the Vajans. Ananda, just as if they had taken counsel with the 33 goats, Sunid and Vesakar are building a fortress as partly Gama. I have seen with my divine eye how thousands of Devas were taking up lodging there. Ananda, as far as the Aryan realm extends, as far as its trade extends, this will be the chief city, partly Putta, scattering its seeds far and wide. And partly Putta will face three perils from fire, from water, and from internal dissensions. Then Sunidha and Vasakara called on the Lord and, having exchanged courtesies, stood to one side and said, May the Reverend Gautama accept a meal from us tomorrow with his ode of monks. And the Lord consented by silence. Understanding his consent, Sunid and Vasakara went home and they had a fine meal of hard and soft food prepared. When it was ready, they reported to the Lord, Reverend Gautama, the meal is ready. The Lord, having dressed in the morning, took his robe and bowl 
when with the order of the monks of the residence of Sunid and Vesakar and sat down on the prepared seat. Then Sunid and Vesakar served the Buddha and his order of monks with choice, soft and hard foods till they were satisfied. And when the Lord took his hand away from the bowl, they sat down on a low stool to one side. And as they sat there, the Lord thanked them with these verses. In whatever realm the wise man makes his home, he should feed the virtuous leaders of the holy life. What are Devas Java who refuse his offering, they will pay him respect and honor for this. They tremble for him as a mother for her son, and he for whom Devas tremble ever happy is. Then the Lord rose from his seat and took his departure. Sunid and Vasakara followed closely behind the Lord, saying, Whichever gate the ascetic Gautama goes out by today, that shall be called the Gautama gate, and whichever ford he uses to cross the Ganges, that shall be called the Gautama ford. And so the gate by which the Lord went out was called the Gautama gate. And then the Lord came to the river Ganges, and just then, the river was so full that a crow could drink out of it. And some people were looking for a boat, and some were looking for a raft, and some were binding together a raft of reeds to get to the other side. But the Lord, as swiftly as a strong man might stretch out his flexed arm or flex it again, vanished from this side of the Ganges and reappeared with his order of monks on the other shore. And the Lord saw those people who were looking for a boat, looking for a raft, and bind together a raft of reeds to get to the other side. And seeing their intentions, he uttered these verses on the spot. When they want to cross the sea, the lake or pond, people make a bridge or raft. The wise have crossed already. End of first recitation section. The Lord said to Ananda, let us go to Kotigama. Very good, Lord, said Ananda. And the Lord went with a large company of monks to Kotigama and stayed there. Then the Lord addressed the monks thus, Monks, it is true not understanding, not penetrating the four noble truths that I as well as you have for a long time run on and gone round the cycle of birth and death. What are they? By not understanding the noble truths of suffering, we have fared on by not understanding the noble truth of origin of suffering, of the cessation of suffering, and the path lead to the cessation of suffering, we have fared on round the cycle of birth and death. And by the understanding, the penetration of the same noble truth of suffering, of the origin of suffering, of the cessation of suffering, and of the path lead to the cessation of suffering, the craving for becoming has been cut off, the support of becoming has been destroyed, and there is no more re-becoming. The Lord having said this, the welfare having spoken, the teacher said, Not seeing the four noble truths as they are, having long traversed the round from life to life, this being seen, becoming supports pulled up, sorrows root cut off, rebirth is done. Then the Lord, while staying at court Likam, gave a comprehensive discourse. This is morality. This is concentration. This is wisdom. Concentration, when imbued with morality, brings great fruit and profit. Wisdom, when imbued with concentration, brings great fruit and profit. The mind imbued with wisdom becomes completely free from the corruptions, that is, from the corrupt sense of sensuality, of becoming, of false views and of ignorance. When the Lord has stayed at Kotigama as long as he wished, he said, Ananda, let us go to Nadika. Very good Lord, said Ananda. And the Lord went with a large company of monks to Nadika, where he stayed at the brick house. And the venerable Ananda came to the Lord, saluted him, sat down to one side and said, Lord, the monks Salla and Nananda have died at Nadika. What rebirth have they taken after death? The lay followers Sudanta and the lay women followers Sudata. The lay followers Kakud, Kalinga, Nikata, Katisab, Tutta, Sunatta, Badd, and Subadda have all died in Nadika. What rebirths have they taken? 
Anand, the monk Sal, by the destruction of the corruption attained in this life through his own super known ledge, the uncorrupted liberation of mind, the liberation by wisdom. The Nananda, by destruction of five lower fetters, has been spontaneously reborn and will be again Nibbana from the state without returning to this world. The lay followers of Dutta, by the destruction of three fetters and the reduction of greed, hatred and delusion, is the one returner who will come back to one more to this world and then make an end of suffering. The lay woman followers of Jata, by the destruction of three fetters, is a stream in a incapable of falling into state of woe, certain of attaining Nibbana. The lay follower Kakud, by the destruction of the five lower fetters, has spontaneously reborn and will gain Nibbana from the state without returning to this world. Likewise, Kalinga, Nikata, Katisab, Tut, Sanut, Badda and Subad. Anand in Nazika, more than 50 lay followers have, by the destruction of the five lower fetters, been spontaneously reborn and will gain Nibbana from the state without returning to this world. Rather, more than 90, by the destruction of three fetters and the reduction of greed, hatred, and delusion, are once returners who will come back once more to this world and then make an end of suffering. And well over 500, by the destruction of three fetters, are stream winners incapable of falling into state of woe, certain of attaining Nibbana. Anand, it is not remarkable that which has come to be as a man should die, but that you should come to the Tathagata to ask the fate of each of those who have died, that is a awareness to him. Therefore, Anand, I will teach you a way of knowing Dhamma, called the mirror of Dhamma, whereby the Aryan disciples, if he so wishes, can discern of himself. I have destroyed hell, animal rebirth, the realm of ghosts, all downfall, evil fates and sorry status. I am a stream winner, incapable of falling into a state of woe, certain of attaining Nibbana. And what is the mirror of Dhamma by which he can know this? He Ananda, his Aryan disciple is possessed of unwavering confidence in the Buddha. Thus, this blessed Lord is an Arahan, a fully enlightened Buddha, endowed with wisdom and conduct, the welfarer, knower of the worlds, incomparable trainer of men to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened and blessed. He is possessed of unwavering faith in the Dhamma. Thus, well proclaimed by the Lord is the Dhamma, visible here and now, timeless, inviting inspection, leading onwards, to be comprehended by the wise, each one for himself. He is possessed of unwavering confidence in the Sangha. Thus, well directed is the Sangha of the Lord disciples, of uprighting conduct on the right path on the right perfect path, that is to say, four pairs of persons, the eight kinds of humans, the Sangha of Lord's disciple is worthy of offerings, worthy of hospitality, worthy of gifts, worthy of veneration, an unsurpassed field of merit in the world, and he is possessed of morality dear to the noble ones, unbroken, without defect, unspotted, without inconsistency, liberating, uncorrupted and conduce you to concentration. This Anand is a mirror of Dhamma, whereby the Arvind disciple can discern of himself. I have destroyed hell, animal rebirth, the realm of ghosts, all downfall, evil fates and sorry status. I am a stream winner, incapable of falling into status of woe, certain of attaining Nibbana. Then the Lord, staying at Nadika in the brick house, gave a comprehensive discourse to the monks. This is a morality. This is concentration. This is wisdom. Concentration when imbued with morality brings great fruit and profit. Wisdom when imbued with concentration brings great fruit and profit. The mind imbued with wisdom becomes completely free from the corruptions. That is, from the corruption is sensuality of becoming, of false views and of ignorance. 
And when the Lord has stayed at Nadika as long as he wished, he went with a large company of monks to Vesali, where he stayed at Ambapali's grove. And there the Lord addressed the monks. Monks, a monk should be mindful and clearly aware this is our charge to you. And how is a monk mindful? Here, a monk abides contemplating the body as body, earnestly clearly aware, mindful and having put away all hankering and fettering for the world. And likewise with regard to feelings, mind and mind objects. That is how a monk is mindful. And how is a monk clearly aware? Here a monk, when going forward or backward, is aware of what he is doing. In looking forward or back, he is aware of what he is doing. In bending and stretching, he is aware of what he is doing. In carrying his inner and outer robe and bowl, he is aware of what he is doing. In eating, drinking, chewing and savouring, he is aware of what he is doing. In passing excrement or urine, he is aware of what he is doing. In walking, standing, sitting or lying down, in keeping awake, in speaking or in staying silent, he is aware of what he is doing. That is how a monk is clearly aware. A monk should be mindful and clearly aware this is our charge to you. Now Ambapali the courts and heard that the Lord has arrived at Vaisali and was staying in her grove. She had the best carriages made ready and drove from Vaisali to her park. She drove as far as the ground would allow. Then it alighted and went on foot to where the Lord was. She saluted the Lord and sat down to one side and as she sat, the Lord instructed, inspired, fired and delighted her with a talk on Dhamma. And being thus delighted, Ambapali said, Lord, may the Lord consent to take a meal from me tomorrow with his order of monks. The Lord consented by silence. And Ambapali, understanding his acceptance, rose from her seat, saluted to the Lord, passing him by to the right, departed. And the Lichivi of Vesali heard that the Lord had arrived at Vesali and was staying at Ambapali's grove. So they had the best carriages made ready and drove out of Vesali. And some of the young Lichivis were all in blue, with blue makeup, blue clothes and blue adornment, while some were in yellow, some in red, some in white, with white makeup, white clothes and white adornment. And Ambapali met the young Lichivis, axle to axle, wheel to wheel, yoke to yoke, and they said to her, Ambapali, why do you drive up against us like that? Because, young sirs, the blessed Lord has been invited by me for a meal with his order of monks. Ambapali, give up this meal for a hundred thousand pieces. Young sirs, if you were to give me the whole Vaisali with its revenue, I would not give up such an important meal. When the Lichvis snapped their fingers, saying, you have been beaten by a mango woman. You have been cheated by the mango woman. And they set out for Amapali's grove. And the Lord, having seen the Lichivis from afar, said, Monks, any of you who haven't seen the 33 goats, just look at these troops of Lichivis. Take a good look at them and you will get an idea of the 33 goats. Then the Lichivis drove in their carriages as far as the ground would allow. Then they alighted and went on foot to where the Lord was, saluted him and sat down to one side. And as they sat, the Lord instructed, inspired, fired and delighted them with the talk of Dhamma. And being thus delighted, they said, Lord, may the Lord consent to take a meal from us tomorrow with his order of monks. But Lichvis, I have already accepted a meal from a tomorrow from the courtesan Ambapali. And the Lichvi snapped their fingers, saying, We have been beaten by the mango woman. We have been cheated by the mango woman. Then, having rejoiced and delighted in his talk, they rose from their seats, saluted the Lord, and, passing him by on the right, departed. And Ambapali, when night was nearly over, Having had choice hard and soft food prepared at her home, announced to the Lord that the meal was ready. Having dressed and taken robe and bowl, 
the Lord went with the order of monks to Amphali's residence and sat down on the prepared seat. And she served the Buddha and his monks with choice, hard and soft food till they were satisfied. And when the Lord had taken his hand from the bowl, Ambapali took a low stool and sat down to one side. So seated, she said, Lord, I give this park to the order of the monks with the Buddha as it heard. The Lord accepted the park and then he instructed, inspired, fired and delighted her with a talk of Dhamma. After which he rose from his seat and departed. Then while staying at Vaisali, the Lord delivered a comprehensive discourse to the monk. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom. Concentration, when imbued with morality, brings great fruit and profit. Wisdom, when imbued with concentration, brings great fruit and profit. The mind imbued with wisdom becomes completely free from the corruptions. That is, from the corruption is sensuality of becoming of false views and of ignorance. And when the Lord has stayed at Ambapali's grove as long as he wished, he went to the large company of monks to the little village of Belur, where he stayed. Then the Lord said to the monks, You monks, should go to anywhere in Vesali where you have friends or acquaintances or supporters and spend the rains there. I shall spend the rains here in Bedouin. Very good, Lord, replied the monks, and they did so. But the Lord spent the rains in Bedouin. And during the rains, the Lord was attacked by a severe sickness, with sharp pains, as if he were about to die. But he endured all this mindfully, clearly aware, and without complaining. He thought, it is not fitting that I should attain final Nibbana without addressing my followers and taking leaves of the ode of the monks. I must hold this disease in check by energy and apply myself to the force of life. He did so and the disease abated. Then the Lord, having recovered from his sickness, as soon as he felt better, went outside and sat on a prepared seat in front of his dwelling. Then the Venerable Anatha came to him, saluted him, sat down to one side and said, Lord, I have seen the Lord in comfort, and I have seen the Lord's patient enduring, and Lord, my body was like a drunkard's. I lost my bearings and things were unclear to me because of the Lord's sickness. The only thing that was some comfort to me was the thought, the Lord will not attain final Nibbana until he has made some statement about the order of monks. But Ananda, what does the order of monks expect from me? I have taught the Dhamma, Ananda, making no inner and outer. The Tathagata has no teachers first in respect of doctrine. If there is anyone who thinks, I shall take charge of the order or the order should be referred to me, let him make some statement about the order, but the Tathagata does not think in such terms. So why should the Tathagata make a statement about the order? Ananda, I am now old, worn out, vulnerable, one who has traversed life's path. I have reached the term of life, which is 80. Just as an old cart is made to go by being held together with straps, so Tathagata's body is kept going by being strapped up. It is only when the Tathagata withdraws his attention from the outward signs and by the cessation of certain feelings, enters into the singless concentration of mind that his body knows comfort. Therefore, Ananda, you should live as islands unto yourselves, being your own refuge. With no one else as your refuge, with the Dhamma as an island, with the Dhamma as your refuge, with no other refuge. And how does a monk live as an island unto himself? With no other refuge? Here, Ananda, a monk abides contemplating the body as body, earnestly, clearly aware, mindful and having put away all hankering and fettering for the world. And likewise with regard to feeling, mind and mind objects, that Ananda is how a monk lives as an island unto himself, with no other refuge. And those who now in my time or afterwards lose this, they will become the highest if they are desirous of learning. 
Then the Lord, rising early, he dressed, took his robe and bowl, and entered where Sali for arms. Having eaten on his return from the arms round, he said to Venerable Anand, Bring him at Anand. We will go to Ta Palestine for the siesta. Very good, Lord, said Anand, and getting a mat, he followed behind. Then the Lord came to Cha Palestine and sat down on the prepared seat. Anand saluted the Lord and sat down to one side. And the Lord said, Anand, Vesar is delightful. The Udain shrine is delightful. The Gotamika shrine is delightful. The Satambaka shrine is delightful. The Bahavata shrine is delightful. The Chapala shrine is delightful. Anand, whoever has dual of four roads to power, practiced them frequently, made his vehicle, made him his base, established them, become familiar with them and properly undertaken them, could undoubtedly live for a century or the remainder of one. The Tathagata has developed these powers, properly undertaken them, and he could Anand undoubtedly live for a century or the remainder of one. But the venerable Anand, failing to grasp the broad hint, this clear sign, did not beg the Lord. Lord, may the blessed Lord stay for a century. May the welfare stay for a century for the benefit and happiness of the multitude, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit and happiness of devas and humans. So much worse is mind possessed by Marva. And a second time, Anand, whoever has dual of four roads to power, practiced them frequently, made his vehicle, made him his base, established them, become familiar with them and properly undertaken them, could undoubtedly live for a century or the remainder of one. The Tathagata has developed these powers, properly undertaken them, and he could Anand undoubtedly live for a century or the remainder of one. But the venerable Anand, failing to grasp the broad hint, this clear sign, did not beg the Lord. Lord, may the blessed Lord stay for a century. May the welfare stay for a century for the benefit and happiness of the multitude, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit and happiness of devas and humans. So much worse is mind possessed by Marva. And a third time, Anand, whoever has dual of four roads to power, practiced them frequently, made his vehicle, made him his base, established them, become familiar with them and properly undertaken them, could undoubtedly live for a century or the remainder of one. The Tathagata has developed these powers, properly undertaken them, and he could Anand undoubtedly live for a century or the remainder of one. But the venerable Anand, failing to grasp the broad hint, this clear sign, did not beg the Lord. Lord, may the blessed Lord stay for a century. May the welfare stay for a century for the benefit and happiness of the multitude, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit and happiness of devas and humans. So much worse is mind possessed by Marva. And then the Lord said, Anand, go now and do what seems fitting to you. Very good, Lord, said Anand, and rising from his seat, he saluted the Lord, passed by on the right, and sat down under a tree some distance away. Soon after Anand left, Mar, the evil one, came to the Lord, stood to one side and said, Lord, may the blessed Lord now attain final Nibbana. May the welfare now attain final Nibbana. Now it's time for the blessed Lord for the final Nibbana. Because the blessed Lord has said this, Evil one, I will not take final Nibbana till I have monks and disciples who are accomplished, trained, skilled, learned, knowers of the Dhamma, trained in conformity to the Dhamma, correctly trained and walking in the path of the Dhamma, who will pass on what they have gained from their teacher, teach it, declare it, establish it, expound it, analyze it, make it clear, till they shall be able to mean of the Dhamma to refute false teaching that have arisen and teach the Dhamma of wondrous effort. And now, Lord, the blessed Lord has such monks and disciples. May the blessed Lord now attain final Nibbana. 
May the welfare now attain final Nibbana. Now is the time for the Blessed Lord's final Nibbana. And the Blessed Lord has said, I will not take the final Nibbana till I have nuns and female disciples who are accomplished, trained, skilled, learned, knowers of the Dhamma, trained in conformity to the Dhamma, correctly trained and walking in the path of the Dhamma, who will pass on what they have gained from their teacher. Teach it, declare it, establish it, expound it, analyze it, make it clear, till they shall be able to mean of the Dhamma to refute false teaching that have arisen and teach the Dhamma of wondrous effort. And now, Lord, the Blessed Lord has such monks and disciples. May the Blessed Lord now attain final Nibbana. May the welfare now attain final Nibbana. Now is the time for the Blessed Lord's final Nibbana. And the Blessed Lord has said, Till I have lame and followers who are accomplished, trained, skilled, learned, knowers of the Dhamma, trained in conformity to the Dhamma, correctly trained and walking in the path of the Dhamma, who will pass on what they have gained from their teacher. Teach it, declare it, establish it, expound it, analyze it, make it clear, till they shall be able to mean of the Dhamma to refute false teaching that have arisen and teach the Dhamma of wondrous effort. And now, Lord, the Blessed Lord has such monks and disciples. May the Blessed Lord now attain final Nibbana. May the welfare now attain final Nibbana. Now is the time for the Blessed Lord's final Nibbana. And the Blessed Lord has said, Till I have lay women followers who are accomplished, trained, skilled, learned, knowers of the Dhamma, trained in conformity to the Dhamma, correctly trained and walking in the path of the Dhamma, who will pass on what they have gained from their teacher. Teach it, declare it, establish it, expound it, analyze it, make it clear, till they shall be able to mean of the Dhamma to refute false teaching that have arisen and teach the Dhamma of wondrous effort. And now, Lord, the Blessed Lord has such monks and disciples. May the Blessed Lord now attain final Nibbana. May the welfare now attain final Nibbana. Now is the time for the Blessed Lord's final Nibbana. And the Blessed Lord has said, May the Blessed Lord now attain final Nibbana. May the welfare now attain final Nibbana. Now is time for the Blessed Lord's final Nibbana. Because the Blessed Lord has said, Evil One, I will not take final Nibbana till his whole life has been successfully established and flourishes. is widespread, well known far and wide well proclaimed among mankind everywhere. And all this has come about. May the Blessed Lord now attain final Nibbana. May the welfare now attain final Nibbana. Now is time for the Blessed Lord's final Nibbana. At this the Lord said tomorrow, You need not to worry, evil one. The Tathagata's final fasting will not be long delayed. Three months from now, Tathagata will take final Nibbana. So the Lord, a Chapala shrine, mindfully and in full awareness, renounces life principle. And when this occurred, there was a great earthquake, terrible, hair rising, and accompanied by thunder. And when the Lord saw this, he uttered this verse Grow so fine, things become the sage absurd. Calm, composed, he bursts becoming shell. And the venerable Ananda thought, it is marvelous. It is wonderful how this great earthquake arises. This terrible earthquake, no dreadful and hair rising, accompanied by thunder. Whatever can have caused it? He went to the Lord, saluted him, sat down to one side and asked him this question. Ananda, there are eight reasons, eight causes for the appearance of a great earthquake. This great earth is established on water, the water on the wind, the wind on space. And when a mighty wind blows, this stirs up the water, and through the stirring up of water, the earth quakes. That is the first reason. In the second place, there is an ascetic of Brahmin who has developed psychic powers. 
O mighty and powerful Deva, whose earth consciousness is weakly developed and his water consciousness is immeasurable, and he makes the earth shudder and shake and violently quake. That is the second reason. Again, when the Bodhisattva descends from the Tusi to heaven, mindful and clear aware, into his mother's womb, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. That is the third reason. Again, when the Bodhisattva emerged from his mother's womb, mindful and clearly aware, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. That is the fourth reason. Again, when the Tathagata gains unsurpassed enlightenment, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. That is the fifth reason. Again, when the Tathagata set in motion the wheel of Dhamma, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. That is the sixth reason. Again, when the Tathagata, mindful and clearly aware, renounces the life principles, when the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. Again, when Tathagata gains the Nibbana limit without remainder, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. That is the eighth reason. These Ananda are the eight reasons, the eight causes for the appearance of a great earthquake. Ananda, these eight kind of assemblies, what are they? They are the assembly of Khatiyas, the assembly of Brahmins, the assembly of householders, the assembly of ascetics, the assembly of Devas of realms of four great kings, the assembly of 33 gods, the assembly of Maras, the assembly of Brahmins. I remember well, Ananda, many hundreds of assemblies of Khatiyas that I have attended. And before I sat down with them, spoke to them or rejoiced in their conversations, I adapted their appearance and speech, whatever it might be, and I instructed, inspired, fired and delighted them with the discourse of Dhamma. And as I spoke with them, they did not know me and wondered, Who is it that speaks like this? A Deva or man? And having thus instructed them, I disappeared and still they did not know. He who has just disappeared, was he a Deva of man? I remember well many hundreds of assemblies of Brahmins, of householders, of ascetics, of Devas of the realm of the four great kings, of thirty-three gods, of marvels, of Brahmins. And so they didn't know. He who has just disappeared, was he a Deva of man? Those Ananda are the eight assemblies. Ananda, there are eight stages of mastery. What are they? Perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms, limited and beautiful or ugly, and in mastering these, one is aware that one knows and sees them. That is the first stage. Perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms, unlimited and beautiful or ugly. That is the second stage. Not perceiving forms internally, not see external forms, limited and beautiful or ugly, that is the third stage. Not perceive forms internally, one sees external forms, unlimited and beautiful or ugly, and in mastering these, one is aware that one knows and sees them, that is the fourth stage. Not perceive forms internally, one sees external forms that are blue, of blue color, of blue luster, just as a flax flower which is blue, of blue color, of blue luster, or generous clothes, smooth on both sides, that is blue, of blue color, of blue luster. So one perceives external forms that are blue, of blue colors, of blue luster, and in mastering this, one is aware that one knows and sees them. That is the fifth stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms that are yellow, of yellow color, of yellow luster, just as a karnika flower, which is yellow, of yellow color, of yellow luster, or banner's cloth that is yellow. So one perceives external forms that are yellow, of yellow color, of yellow luster. That is the sixth stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms that are red, of red color, of red luster. Just as a hibiscus flower which is red, 
of red color of red luster or a Benares cloth which is red of red color of red luster. So one first use external forms that are red of red color of red luster that is a seven stage. What perseum forms internally one sees external forms that are white of white color of white luster just as the morning nissa ojadi is white of white color of white luster over benaros clothes smooth on both sides that is white of white color of white luster so not perceiving forms internally one sees external forms that are white of white color of white luster and in mastering these one is aware that one knows and sees them that is the eighth stage of mastery these ananda are the eight stages of mastery jara ananda these eight liberations what are they possessing forms one sees forms that is the first not perceiving material forms in oneself one sees them outside that is the second thinking it is beautiful one becomes intent on it that is third by completely transcending all perceptions of matter thinking space is finite one enters and abides in the sphere of infinite space that is the fourth by transcending the sphere of infinite space thinking consciousness is infinite one enters and abides in the sphere of infinite consciousness that is the fifth by transcending the sphere of infinite consciousness thinking there is nothing one enters and abides in the sphere of nothingness that is sixth by transcending the sphere of nothingness one reaches and abides in the sphere of neither perception no non perception that's the seventh by transcending the sphere of neither perception no non perception one enters and abides in the cessation of perception and feeling that is the eighth liberation ananda once i was staying at the uruveli at the bank of the river navranjana under the godus banyan tree when i had just attained supreme enlightenment and mar the evil one came to me stood to one side and said may the blessed lord now attain final nibbana may the welfare now attain final nibbana now is time for the blessed lord's final nibbana at this i said to mar evil one i will not take final nibbana till i have monks and disciples who are accomplished trained skilled learned knowers of the dhamma trained in conformity with the dhamma correctly trained and walking in the path of dhamma who will pass on what they have gained from their teacher teach it declare it establish it expound it analyze it make it clear till they shall be able to means of dhamma to refute false teaching that have arisen and teach them of wondrous effect i will not take final nibbana till this holy life has been successfully established and flourished it is widespread well known far and wide well proclaimed among mankind everywhere and just now today anand at the chapel shrine mar came to me stood to one side and said lord may the blessed lord now attain final nibbana now is the time for the blessed lord's final nibbana and i said you need not worry evil one three months from now the tathagata will take the final nibbana so now today anand at the chapel shrine the tathagata has mindfully and in full awareness renounced the life principle at this the venerable anand said lord lord may the blessed lord stay for a century may the welfare of stay for a century for the benefits and happiness of the multitude out of compassion for the world for the benefits and happiness of devas and humans in afanand do not beg the tagas it is not the right time for that and a second time and the third time the venerable anand made the same request anand have you faith in the tagas enlightenment yes lord then why do you bother the tagas with your request after three times but lord i have heard from the lord's own lips i have understood from the lord's own lips who has developed the four roads to power could undoubtedly live for a century or for the remainder of one have you faith anand yes lord then anand yes is the fault 
news is a failure that, having been given such a broad hint, such a clear sign by the Tathagata, you did not understand and did not beg the Tathagata to stay for a century. If Anand, you had begged him, the Tathagata would have twice refused you, but the third time Tathagata would have consented. Therefore, Anand, yours is the fault, yours is the failure. Once, Anand, I was staying at Vajagaha, at the vulture's peak, and there I said, Anand, Vajagaha is delightful, the vulture's peak is delightful. Puve has developed the four roads to power, could undoubtedly live for a century. But you, Anand, in spite of such a broad hint, did not understand and did not beg the Tathagata to stay for a century. Once I was staying at the Vajagaha in the Banyan Park, at Robber's Cliff, at Satyapani Cave on the side of Mount Vebhara, at the Black Rock on the slope of Mount Isigili, at the slope by the Snake's Pool in Coolwood, at the Tapoza Park, at the Squirrel's Feeding Ground in Veluvana, in Jeevaka's Mango Grove, and also at Rajagaha in the Madhukuchi's Deer Park. At all these places I say to you, Anand, this place is delightful. Whoever has developed the four roads to power could undoubtedly live for a century. Once I was at Vesari at the Udena Shrine, once I was at Vesari at the Gotamaka Shrine, at the Satambaka Shrine, at the Bahuputsa Shrine, at the Shrana Sai. And now today at Chapari Shrine I said, these places are delightful. Ananda who has developed the four roads to power could undoubtedly live for a century or the remainder of one. The Tathagata has developed these powers and he could Ananda undoubtedly live for a century or the remainder of one. But you Ananda, failing to grasp these broad hint, this clear sign, did not beg the Tathagata to stay for a century. If Ananda, you had begged him, the Tathagata would have twice refused you, but the third time he would have consented. Anand, have I not told you before, all these things that are dear and pleasant to us must suffer change, separation and alteration. So how could this be possible? Whatever is born, become, compounded, is liable to decay. And that has been renounced, given up, rejected, abandoned, forsaken. The Tathagata has renounced the life principle. The Tathagata said once for all, the Tathagata's final passing will not be long delayed. Three months from now, the Tathagata will take final Nibbana that the Tathagata should withdraw such a declaration in order to live on is not possible. Now come, Anand, you will go to the gable hole in the great forest. Very good, Lord. And the Lord went with the venerable Anand to the gabled hole in the great forest. When he got there, he said, Anand, go and gather together all the monks living in the vicinity of Vesali and get them to come to the assembly hall. Very good, Lord, said Anand, and did so. He then returned to the Lord, saluted him, stood to one side and said, Lord, the order of the monks is gathered together. Now it is time for the Lord to do as he wishes. The Lord entered the assembly hall and sat down on the prepared seat. Then he said to the monks, Monks, for this reason those matters which I have discovered and proclaimed should be thoroughly learned by you, practiced, developed and cultivated, so that this whole life may endure for a long time, that it may be for the benefit and happiness of the multitude, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit and happiness of devas and humans. And what are those matters? They are the four foundation of mindfulness, the four right effort, the four roads to power, the five spiritual faculties, the five mental powers, the seven factors of enlightenment, and the noble eightfold path. Then the Lord said to the monks, And now, monks, I declare to you, all conditioned things are of a nature to decay. Strive on untiringly. The Tathagata's final passing will not be long delayed. Three months from now, the Tathagata will take his final Nibbana. Thus the Lord spoke. 
The welfare having thus spoken, the teacher said this, Arrive I am in years, my life spans determined. Now I go from you, having made my life my refuge. Monks, be untiring, mindful, disciplined, guarding your minds with well-collected thoughts. He who tireless keeps to law and discipline, leaving birth behind will put an end to you. End of third recitation section. Then the Lord, having risen early and dressed, took his robe and bowl and went into ways only for arms. Having returned from the arms round and eaten, he looked back at the Vezali with his elephant look and said, Ananda, this is the last time the Tathagata will look upon Vezali. Now we will go to Bandhagama. Very good Lord, said Ananda. And the Lord proceeded with a large company of monks to Bandhagama and stayed there. And there the Lord addressed the monks. It is monks. To not understanding, not presenting four things that I as well as you have for a long time fared on round of cycles of rebirth. What are the four? Through not understanding the Aryan morality, to not understanding the Aryan concentration, to not understand the Aryan wisdom, to not understanding the Aryan liberation, I as well as you have for a long time fared on the round of cycle of rebirth, and it is by understanding and penetrating the Aryan morality, the Aryan concentration, the Aryan wisdom, and the Aryan liberation that the craving for becoming has been cut off, the tendency towards becoming has been exhausted, and there will be no more rebirth. Thus the Lord spoke. The welfarer having thus spoken, the teacher said this, Morality, Samadhi, wisdom and final release. These glorious things Gautama came to know. The Dhamma he discerned, he taught his monks. He whose vision ended Wu to Nibbana's God. Then the Lord, while staying at Bandhagama, delivered a comprehensive discourse. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom. Concentration, when imbued with morality, brings great fruit and profit. Wisdom, when imbued with concentration, brings great fruit and profit. The mind imbued with wisdom becomes completely free from corruptions, that is, from corruption of sensuality, of becoming, of false views and of ignorance. And when the Lord has stayed at Bandhagama for as long as he wished, he said, Ananda, let us go to Hattigama, to Ambagama, to Jambugama, giving the same discourses at each place. Then he said, Ananda, let us go to Bojanagara. Very good Lord, said Ananda. And the Lord went with a large company of monks to Bojanagara. At Bojanagara, the Lord stayed at the Ananda shrine. And here he said to the monks, Monks, I will teach you four criteria. Listen, pay close attention, and I'll speak. Yes, Lord, replied the monks. Suppose a monk were to say, Friends, I heard and received this from the Lord's own lips. This is the Dhamma. This is the discipline. This is the Master's teaching. Then monks, you should neither approve nor disapprove his words. Then without approving or disapproving, his words and expressions should be carefully noted and compared with the suttas and reviewed in the light of the discipline. If they, on such comparison and review, are found not to confirm to the suttas or the discipline, the conclusion must be, as surely this is not the word of the Buddha, it has been wrongly understood by this monk. The matter is not to be rejected, but where on such comparison and review they are found to confirm to the sutta or the discipline. The conclusion must be, as surely this is the word of the Buddha. It has been rightly understood by this monk. This is the first criterion. Suppose a monk were to say, in such and such a place, there is a community with elders and distinguished teachers. I have heard and received this from the community. Then monks, you should neither approve nor disapprove his words. Then without approving or disapproving, 
His words and expressions should be carefully noted and compared with the suttas and reviewed in the light of the discipline. If they, on such comparison and review, are found not to confirm to the suttas or the discipline, the conclusion must be, as surely this is not the word of the Buddha, it has been wrongly understood by this monk. The matter is not to be rejected, but where on such comparison and review they are found to confirm to the sutta or the discipline. The conclusion must be, as surely this is the word of the Buddha. It has been rightly understood by this monk. There is a second criterion. Suppose a monk were to say, in such and such a place, there are many elders who are learned, bearers of the tradition, who knows the Dhamma, the discipline, the code of rules, then monks, you should neither approve nor disapprove his words. Then without approving or disapproving, his words and expressions should be carefully noted and compared with the suttas and reviewed in the light of the discipline. If they, on such comparison and review, are found not to confirm to the suttas or the discipline, the conclusion must be, as surely this is not the word of the Buddha, it has been wrongly understood by this monk. The matter is not to be rejected, but where on such comparison and review they are found to confirm to the sutta or the discipline. The conclusion must be, as surely this is the word of the Buddha. It has been rightly understood by this monk. Suppose a monk were to say, in such and such a place, there is an elder who is learned. I have heard and received this from this elder. Then monks, you should neither approve nor disapprove his words. Then without approving or disapproving, his words and expressions should be carefully noted and compared with the suttas and reviewed in the light of the discipline. If they, on such comparison and review, are found not to confirm to the suttas or the discipline, the conclusion must be, as surely this is not the word of the Buddha, it has been wrongly understood by this monk. The matter is not to be rejected, but where on such comparison and review they are found to confirm to the sutta or the discipline. The conclusion must be, as surely this is the word of the Buddha. It has been rightly understood by this monk. But where on such comparison and review? Then the Lord, while staying at Bhojanagara, delivered a comprehensive discourse. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom. And when the Lord had stayed at Bhojanagara for as long as he wished, he said, Ananda, let's go to Pava. Very good, Lord, said Ananda. And the Lord went with a large company of monks to Pava, where he stayed at the mango grove of Chunda the smith. The Chunda heard that the Lord had arrived at Pava and was staying at his mango grove. So he went to the Lord, saluted him and sat down to the one side, and the Lord instructed, inspired, fired and delighted with him a talk on them. Then Chunda said, May the Lord accept a meal from me tomorrow with his order of monks. And the Lord consented by silence. And Chunda, understanding his consent, rose from his seat, saluted the Lord, and passing by the right, departed. And as the night was ending, Chunda had a fine meal of hard and soft food, prepared with an abundance of pig's delight. And when it was ready, he reported to the Lord, Lord, the meal is ready. Then the Lord, having dressed in the morning, took his robe and bowl, and went with his order of monks to the Chunda's dwelling, where he sat down on the prepared seat and said, Serve the pig's delight that has been prepared to me, and serve the remaining hard and soft food to the order of monks. A very good Lord, said Chunda, and did so. Then the Lord said to Chunda, Whatever is left over of the pig's delight, you should bury in a pit, because Chunda, I can see none in this world with its devas, maurus, and brahmas, in this generation with its ascetics and brahmins, its princes and the people who, if they were to eat it, could thoroughly digest it except the Taragata. Very good Lord, said Chunda, and having buried the remaining of the pig's delight in a pit, he came to the Lord, saluted him, 
and sat down to one side. And the Lord, having instructed, inspired, fired and delighted him with thoughts on Dhamma, rose from his seat and departed. And after having eaten a meal provided by Chinde, and after having eaten the meal provided by Chinde, the Lord was attacked by a severe sickness with blood diarrhea and with sharp pains as if he were about to die. But he endured all this mindfully and clearly aware and without complaint. Then the Lord said, Ananda, let us go to Kusinaura. Very good Lord, said Ananda. This have I heard. Having eaten Chunda's meal, he suffered a grave illness, painful, deathly. From eating a meal of pig's delight, grave sickness assailed the teacher. Having purged, the Lord then said, Now I'll go to Kusinara town. Then turning aside from the road, the Lord went to the foot of the tree and said, Come on, and fold robe in four for me. I'm tired and want to sit down. Very good, Lord, said Ananda, and did so. The Lord sat down on the prepared seat and said, Ananda, bring me some water. I am thirsty and want to drink. Ananda replied, Lord, five hundred carts have passed this way. The water is churned up by their wheels and is not good. It is dirty and disturbed. But Lord, the river Kukuta nearby has clear water, pleasant, cool, pure, with beautiful banks, delightful. There the Lord shall drink the water and cool his limbs. A second time the Lord said, Ananda, bring me some water. And Ananda replied as before. A third time the Lord said, Ananda, bring me some water. I am thirsty and want to drink. Very good Lord, said Ananda. And taking his bowl, he went to the stream. And that stream, whose water had been churned up by the wheels and was not good, dirty, and disturbed, as another approached, it began to flow pure, bright, and unsullied. And the venerable Ananda thought, Wonderful, marvelous are the great and mighty powers. This water has churned up by wheels, and at my approach, it flows pure, bright, and unsullied. He took water in the bowl, brought it to the Lord, and told him of his thoughts, saying, May the Lord drink the water, may the welfare drink. And the Lord drank the water. At the moment Pukkusa the Malla, a pupil of Alara Kalama, was going along the main road from Kusinawa to Pava, seeing the Lord sitting under a tree. He went over, saluted him, and sat down to one side. Then he said, It is wonderful, Lord. It is marvelous how calm these wanderers are. Once, Lord, Alara Kalama was going along the main road and turning side. He went and sat down under a nearby tree to take his siesta, and five hundred cars went rumbling by very close to him. A man who was walking alone behind them came to Alar Khalam and said, Lord, did you not see five hundred cars go by? No, friend, I did not. But didn't you hear them, Lord? No, friend, I did not. Well, were you asleep, Lord? No, friend, I wasn't asleep. Then, Lord, were you conscious? Yes, friend. So, Lord, being conscious and awake, you neither saw nor heard 500 cars passing close by you, even though your outer robe was bespattered with dust. That is so, friend. And that man thought, It is wonderful. It is marvelous. These wanderers are so calm that though conscious and awake, the man neither saw nor heard 500 cars passing close by him. And he went away praising Al Arakalam's lofty powers. Well, Pukus, what do you think? What do you consider is more difficult to do or attain to, while conscious and awake not to see or hear 500 cars pass in nearby or while conscious and awake not to see or hear anything when the rain goes streams and splashes, when lightning flashes and thunder crashes? Lord, how can one compare not seeing or hearing 500 cars with that? or even six, seven, eight, nine, or ten hundred, or hundreds of thousands of cart of that. To see or hear nothing when such a storm rage is more difficult. Once because I was staying at Arthama at the threshing floor. The rain goes streamed and splashed, lightning flashed and thunder crashed, and two farmers, brothers and four oxen were killed. 
and a lot of people went out of Atama to where the two brothers and the four oxen were killed. And Fukuzu, I had at that time gone out of the door of the threshing floor and was walking up and down outside. And a man from the crowd came to me, saluted me and stood to one side. And I said to him, Friend, why are all these people gathered here? Lord, there has been a great storm and two farmers, brothers and four oxen have been killed. But you, Lord, where have you been? I have been right here, friend. But what did you see, Lord? I saw nothing, friend. Oh, what did you hear, Lord? I heard nothing, friend. Were you sleeping? I wasn't sleeping, friend. Then, Lord, were you conscious? Yes, friend. So, Lord, being conscious and awake, you neither saw nor heard the great rainfall and flood and the thunders and lightning? That is so, friend. And focus it. That man thought, it is wonderful, it is marvellous. These wanderers are so calm and they neither see nor hear when rain god stream and splashes, lightning flashes and thunder crashes. Proclaiming my lofty powers, he saluted me, passed by to the right and departed. At this book, the mullah said, Lord, I reject the lofty powers of our Kalama as if were blown away by a mighty wind or carried off by a swiftly streams of river. Excellent, Lord, excellent. It is as if someone were set up to what had been knocked down, or point out the way to one had got lost, or to bring an oil lamp into dark place, so those with eyes could see what was there. Just so the blessed Lord has expounded the Dhamma in various ways. And I, Lord, go for the refuge the blessed Lord, the Dhamma and the Sangha, May the blessed Lord accept me from his day forth as a lay follower as long as life shall last. Then Pukasa said to one man, Go and fetch me two fine set of robes of clothes of gold, burnished and ready to wear. Yes, Lord, the man replied, and did so. And Pukasa offered the robes to the Lord, saying, Here, Lord, are two fine set of robes of clothes of gold. May the blessed Lord be graciously pleased to accept them. Well then, Pukuse, clothe me in one set and Ananda in other. Very good, Lord, said Pukuse and did so. Then the Lord instructed, inspired, fired and delighted Pukuse, the mala with the talk on Dhamma. When the Pukuse rose from his seat, saluted the Lord, passed by to the right and departed. Soon after Pukuse had gone, Ananda, having arranged one set of golden robes on the body of the Lord, observed that against the Lord's body it appeared dull. And he said, It is wonderful, Lord. It is marvelous how clear and bright the Lord's skin appears. It looked even brighter than the golden robes in which it is clothed. Just so, Ananda, there are two occasions on which the Tathagata's skin appears especially clear and bright. Which are they? One is night in which Tathagata gains supreme enlightenment. The other is the night when he attained the Nibbana element without remainder at his final passing. On these two occasions, the Tathagata's skin appears specially clear and bright. Tonight, Ananda, in the last watch, in the salgro of Malla's near Kusinara, between two sal trees, the Tathagata's final passing will take place. And now, Ananda, let us go to the river Kukuta, very good lord, said Ananda. Two golden robes of Pukuzu's offering, bright shone the teacher's body than its dress. Then the lord went to the large number of monks to the river Kukuta. He entered the water, bathed and drank and emerging, went to the mango grove, where he said to the venerable Chundaka, Come Chundaka, fold me a robe in four for me, I am tired and want to lie down. Very good lord, said Chundaka and did so. The Lord adopted lion posture, lying on his right side, placing one foot on the other, mindfully and with clear awareness, bearing in mind the time he is awakening. And the Venerable Chundaka sat down in front of the Lord, the Buddha having gone to the Kuku to the river, which is clear, bright, and pleasant water. Jarin the teacher plunged his very body. Tathagata, without an equal in the world, surrounded by the monks whose head he was, the teacher and the Lord, preserver of Dhamma. To the Bangu grove, the great Sangha went. And to Chundaka, the monk, he said, On a fourfold robe, I have lied down. And thus adjured by the great Adab. Chundaka placed the fourfold robe. 
The teacher laid his weary limbs to rest, while Chandraka kept watch beside him. Then the Lord said to the venerable Anand, It might happen, Anand, that Chunda the smith should feel remorse, thinking, It is your fault, friend Chunda. It is by your misdeed that the Tathagat again fell in Nibbana after taking his last meal from you. But Chunda's remorse should be expelled in this way. That is your merit, Chunda. That is your good deed. That the Tathagat again fell in Nibbana after taking his last meal from you. For friend Chunda, I have heard and understood from the Lord's own lips that these two arms giving are very great, fruit of very great result, more fruitful and advantageous than any other. Which two? The one is the arms giving after eating which Tathagata attains supreme enlightenment, the other that after which he attains the Nibbana element without remainder of his final passing. These two arms giving are more fruitful and profitable than all others. Chunda's deed is conducive to long life, to good looks, to happiness, to fame, to heaven and lordship. In this way, Ananda, Chunda's remorse is to be expelled. Then the Lord, having settled his matter, at the time uttered this verse. By giving merit, goes by restraint, hatred checked. He who is killed abandoned evil things. As greed, hate and folly vain, Nibbana gained. End of fourth recitation section concerning Alara. The Lord said, Anand, let us cross the Hiranyavati river and go to the Malla Sal grove in the vicinity of Kozinara. Very good, Lord, said Anand. And the Lord, with a large company of monks, crossed the river and went to the Sal grove. That the Lord said, Anand, prepare me a bed between these Sal trees, with my head to the north, and I am tired and want to lie down. Very good, Lord said Arand, and did so. Then the Lord lay down on his right side in the lion posture, placing one foot on the other, mindful and clearly aware. And those twin salt trees burst forth into the abundance of untimely blossoms, which fell upon the Tathagata's body, sprinkling it and covering it in homage. Divine coral tree flowers fell from the sky. Divine sandalwood powder fell from the sky sprinkling and covering Tathagata's body in the homage. Divine music and song sounded from the sky in the homage to Tathagata. And the Lord said, Anand, these salt trees have burst forth into an abundance of untimely blossoms. Divine music and song sound from the sky in homage to the Tathagata. Never before has the Tathagata been so honoured, revered, esteemed, worshipped and adored. And yet, Arand, whatever monk, nun, male or female lay followers dwell practicing the Dhamma properly and perfectly fulfill the Dhamma way, he or she honor the Tathagata, revere and esteem him and pays him the supreme homage. Therefore, Arand, we will dwell practicing the Dhamma properly and perfectly, fulfill the Dhamma way. This must be your watchword. Just then the Venerable Upasiva was standing in front of the Lord, fanning him. And the Lord told him to move. Move aside, monk. Don't stand in front of me. And the Venerable Arnold thought, This Venerable Upasiva has for long been the Lord's attendant, keeping close at hand at his back and all. And now his last hour the Lord tells him to stand aside and not stand in front of him. Why ever does he do that? And he asked the Lord about this. Anand, the Devas from the ten world's fuses have gathered to see the Tathagata. For a distance of a twelve yojans around the Malle Sagro near Kuzinara, there is not a space you could touch with the point of a hair that is not filled with mighty Devas. And they are grumbling. We have come a long way to see the Tathagata. It is rare for Tathagata, a fully entitled Buddha, to arise in the world, and tonight in the last watch of the Tathagata will attain final Nibbana. And this mighty monk is standing in front of the Lord, preventing us from getting a last glimpse of the Tathagata. But Lord, what kind of Devas can Lord perceive? Anand, there are sky Devas whose minds are earthbound, they are weeping and tearing their hair, raising their arms, throwing themselves down and twisting and turning, crying. 
All too soon the blessed Lord is passing away. All too soon the welfare is passing away. All too soon the eye of the world is disappearing. And there are earth devas whose minds are earth bound who do likewise. But those devas who are free from craving endure patiently saying, All compounded things are impermanent. What is in use of this? Lord, formerly monks who had spent the rains in various places used to come to see the Tathagata and we used to welcome them so that such well-trained monks might see you and pay their respects. But with Lord's passing, we shall no longer have a chance to do this. Anand, there are four places the sight of which should arouse emotion in the faithful. Which are they? Here the Tathagata was born is the first. Here the Tathagata attains supreme enlightenment is the second. Here the Tathagata set in motion the wheel of Dhamma is the third. Here the Tathagata attained the Nibbana element without remainder is the fourth. And Anand, the faithful monks and nuns, male and female lay followers, will visit those places. And any who die while making the pilgrimage of these shrines with the devout heart will, at the breaking of the body after death, be born in heavenly world. Lord, how should we act towards women? Do not see them, Ananda. But if we see them, how should we behave, Lord? Don't speak to them, Ananda. But if they speak to us, Lord, how should we behave? Practice mindfulness, Ananda. Lord, what shall we do with the Tathagata's remains? Don't worry about yourself about the funeral arrangements, Ananda. You should strive for the highest goal. Devote yourselves to the highest goal and dwell with your mind tirelessly. Seriously devoted to the highest goal. There are wise Khatiyas, Brahmins and householders. There are wise Khatiyas, Brahmins and householders who are devoted to the Tathagata. They will take care of the funeral. But Lord, what are we do with the Tathagata's remains? Arand, they should be dealt with like the remains of the wheel turning monarch. And how is that, Lord? Anand, the remains of the wheel turning monarch are wrapped in a new linen cloth. This they are wrapped in a teased cotton wool and this in a new cloth. Having done this 500 times each, they enclose the king's body in an oil wet of iron, which is covered with another iron pot. Then having made a funeral pyre of all manner of perfumes, they cremate the king's body and they raise a stoop at a crossroads. That Anand is what they do to the remains of the wheel turning monarch and they should be deal with the Tathagata's body in the same way. A stoop should be created at the crossroads for the Tathagata and whoever lays wets or puts sweet perfumes and colors there with a devout heart will reap benefit and happiness for a long time. Anand, there are four persons worthy of a stupa. Who are they? A Tathagata, Arahant, fully enlightened Buddha is one, a Pacheka Buddha is one, a disciple of Tathagata is one, and a wheel turning monarch is one. And why is each of these worthy of a stupa? Because Anand, at the thought, this is a stupa of a Tathagata, of a Pacheka Buddha, of a disciple of the Tathagata, of a wheel turning monarch. People's hearts are made peaceful and then at the breaking up of the body after death they go to a good destiny and races in the heavenly world. That is the reason and those are the four who are worthy of a stupor. And the venerable Ananda went into his lodging and stood lamenting, leaning on the doorpost. Alas, I'm still a learner with much to do and the teacher is passing away. Who was so compassionate to me? The Lord inquired of the monks where Ananda was, and they told him. So he said to a certain monk, Go, monk, and say to Ananda from me, Friend Ananda, the teacher summons you. Very good, Lord, said the monk, and did so. Very good, friend. Ananda replied to the monk, and he went to the Lord, saluted him, and sat down to one side. And the Lord said, Enough, Ananda, do not weep and wail. Have I not already told you that all things that are pleasant and delightful are changeable, subject to separation and becoming other? So how could it be, Ananda, since whatever is born become compounded is subject to decay? How could it be that it should not pass away? 
for a long time anand you have seen in the tathagata's presence showering loving kindness in act of body speech and mind beneficially blessedly wholeheartedly you have achieved much merit anand make the effort and in short time you will be free of the corruptions then the lord addressed the monks monks all those who were arahant fully enlightened buddhas in the past have had just such a chief attendant as anand and so too will those blessed lords who come in the future monks anand is wise he knows when it is the right time for monks to come to see the tathagata when it is the right time for nuns for the male lay followers for female lay followers for kings for royal ministers for leaders of the other schools and for their pupils anand has remarkable and wonderful qualities what are they if a company of monks come to see anand they are pleased at the sight of him and when anand talks dhamma to them they are pleased and when he is silent they are disappointed and so it is too with nuns with male and female lay followers and these four qualities apply to a real turning monarch if he is visited by a company of kathiyas of brahmins of householders or of ascetics they are pleased at the sight of him and when he talks to them and when he is silent they are disappointed and so too it is with anand after this venerable anand said lord may the blessed lord not pass away in this miserable little town of wattle and dog right in the jungle in the back of beyond lord there are other great cities such as champa rajagaha savatti saket kosambi or varanasi in those places there are wealthy kathiyas brahmins and householders who are devoted to tathagata and they will provide for the tathagata's funeral in a proper style anand don't call this is a miserable little town of wattle and dog right in the jungle in the back of the beyond once upon a time anand king mahasudasana was a real turning monarch a rightful and righteous king who had conquered the land of four directions and ensured the security of his realm and who possessed the seven treasures and anand this king mahasudasana had this very kusinara under the name of kusavati for his capital and it was 12 jones long from east to west and seven yojans wide from north to south kusavati was rich prosperous and well populated crowded with people and well stocked with food just as the deva city of alakamandava is rich prosperous and well populated crowded with yakkas and well stocked with food so was royal city of kusavati and the city of kusavati was never free of ten sounds by day or night the sound of elephants horses carriages kettle drums side drums lutes singing cymbals and gongs with cries of eat drink and be merry as tent and now arand go to kusinara and announce the malas of kusinara tonight wasettes in the last watch the tathagata will attain final nibbana approach him wasettes approach him less later you should regret it saying the tathagata passed away in our parish and we did not take the opportunity to see him for the last time very good lord said anand and taking rope and bowl he went with a companion to kusinara just then the mallas of kusinara were assembled in their meeting hall on some business and anand came to them and delivered the lord's words and when they heard anand's words the mallas with their sons daughter-in-law and wives were struck with anguish and sorrow their minds were overcome with grief so that they were all weeping and tearing their hair then they all went to the sal grove where the venerable anand was and anand thought if i allow the mallas of kusinara to salute the lord individually the night will have passed before they have all paid homage i had better let them pay homage family by family saying lord the mallas so and so with his children his wife his servants and his friends pays homage at the lord's feet and so he presented them in that way and this allowed all mallas of kusinara to pay homage 
to the Lord in the first watch. And at the time the wanderer called Zubad the verse in Kuzinara, and he heard that as it is goeth the verse to attain final Nibbana in the final watch of the night, he thought, I have heard from venerable wanderers, advanced in years, teachers of teachers, that a Tathagata, a fully enlightened Buddha, only rarely arises in the world, and tonight in the last watch, the ascetic Gautam will attain final Nibbana. Now a doubt has arisen in my mind, and I feel sure that the ascetic Gautam can teach me a doctrine to dispel that doubt. So Subhadra went to the Malla Salgrove to where the venerable Ananda was and told him that he had thought, Reverend Ananda, may I be permitted to see the ascetic Gautam? But Ananda replied, Enough, friend Subhadra, don't disturb the Tathagata, the Lord is weary. And the Subhadra made his request a second time and a third time, but still Ananda refused it. But the Lord overheard the conversation between Ananda and Subhadra, and he called to Ananda, Enough, Ananda, don't hinder Subhadra, let him see the Tathagata. For whatever Subhadra asks me, he will ask in quest of enlightenment, and not to annoy me. And what I say in reply to his questions, he will quickly understand. Then Ananda said, Go in friend, Subhadra, the Lord gives you leave. The Subhadra approached the Lord, exchanged courtesies with him, and sat down to one side, saying, Venerable Gautama, all those ascetics and Brahmins who have orders and followings, who are teachers, well known and famous as founders of schools, and popularly regarded as saints, like Purana Kassapa, Makkali Gosala, Aditya Kesa Kambali, Pakudaka Chayana, Sanjay Bellatra Putta, and the Nigantanatha Putta, have they all realized the truth as they all make out? Or have none of them realized it? Or have some realized it and some not? Enough, Subhavda. Never mind whether all, or none, or some of them have realized the truth. I will teach you Dhamma, Subhavda. Listen, pay close attention. Now I will speak. Yes, Lord said Subhadra, and the Lord said, In whatever Dhamma and discipline the noble Eightfold Path is not found, no ascetic is found of the first, the second, and the third or fourth grade, but such ascetics can be found of the first, second, third and fourth grade in a Dhamma and the discipline where the noble Eightfold Path is found. Now Subhadra, in this Dhamma and the discipline the noble Eightfold Path is found, and in it are to be found ascetics of the first, second, third, and fourth grade. Those other schools are devoid of true ascetics, but if in this one the monks were to live the life of perfection, the world would not be lack of arahants. Twenty nine years of age I was when I went forth to seek the good. Now over fifty years have passed since the day I went forth to roam the realm of wisdom's law outside of which no ascetic is, first, second, third or fourth degree. Other schools of such are where, but if here monks live perfectly, the world wouldn't lack of arahants. At this the wanderer Subhadra said, Excellent Lord, excellent. It is as if someone were to set up the what had been knocked down or to point out the way to one who had got lost or to bring an oil lamp into a dark place, so that those with eyes could see what was there. Just so the blessed Lord has expounded the Dhamma in various ways. And I, Lord, go for refuge to the blessed Lord, the Dhamma and the Sangha. May I receive the going forth in the Lord's presence. May I receive ordination. Subhadra, whoever coming from another school seeks the going forth and ordination in this Dhamma and discipline, must wait four months on probation, and at the end of four months, those monks who are established in mind may let him go forth and give him ordination to the statue of a monk. However, there can be distinctions of presence. Lord, if those coming from other schools must wait four months of probation, I will wait four years, and then let them give me the going forth and the ordination. But the Lord said to Anand, let Subhadra go forth. Very good, Lord, said Ananda. And the Subhadra said to the Venerable Ananda, Friend Ananda, 
it is a great gain for you all. It is very profitable for you that you have obtained the concentration of discipline in the teacher's process. Then Subhadar received the going forth in the Lord's presence and the ordination. And from the moment of his ordination, the Venerable Subhadar alone, secluded, unwearing, sealed and resolute, in a short time attained to that for the which young men of good family go forth from the household life into homelessness, that excelled culmination of the holy life, having realized it here and now by his own insight and dwelt therein. Birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done, there's nothing further here. And the Venerable Subhadra became another of the Arahans. He was the last personal disciple of the Lord. End of the fifth recitation section, Hiranyavati. And the Lord said to Anand, Anand, it may be that you will think the teacher's instruction has ceased. Now we have no teacher. It should not be seen like this. Anand, what I have taught and explained to you as Dhamma and a discipline will at my passing be your teacher. And whereas the monks are in the habit of addressing one another as friend, this custom is to be abrogated after my passing. Senior monks shall address more junior monks by their name, their clan, or as friend, whereas more junior monks are to address their seniors either as Lord or as Venerable Sir. If they wish, the order may be abolish the minor rules after my passing. After my passing, the monk's chan is to receive the Brahma penalty. But Lord, what is the Brahma penalty? Whatever the monk's chan warns or says, he is not to be spoken to, admonished or instructed by the monks. And the Lord addressed the monks saying, It may be monks, that some monks has doubts or uncertainty about the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, or about the path or the practice. Ask monks, don't afterward feel remorse thinking the teacher was there before us and we failed to ask the Lord face to face. At these words the monks were silent. The Lord repeated his words a second time and a third time and still the monks were silent. Then the Lord said, Perhaps monks, you don't ask out of respect for the teacher. Then monks, let one friend tell it to another. But still they were silent. And the Venerable Ananda said, It is wonderful, Lord. It is marvelous. I clearly perceive that in this assembly there is not one monk who has doubts or uncertainty. You, Ananda, speak for faith. But the Tathagata knows that in this assembly there is not one monk who has doubts or uncertainty about the Buddha, the Dhamma, or the Sangha, or about the path or the practice. Ananda, the least one of these 500 monks is stream winner, incapable of falling into a state of woe, certain of Nibbana. And the Lord said to the monks, Now monks, I declare to you, all conditioned things are of nature to decay. Strive on untiringly. These were the Tathagata's last words. Then the Lord entered the first jhana, and the leaving that he entered the second, the third, and the fourth jhana. Then leaving the fourth jhana, he entered the sphere of infinite space, then the sphere of infinite consciousness, then the sphere of nothingness, then the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception, and leaving that he attained the cessation of feeling and perception. Then the Venerable Anand said to the Venerable Anruddha, Venerable Anruddha, the Lord has passed away. No, friend, the Lord has not passed away. He has attained the cessation of feeling and perception. Then the Lord, leaving the attainment of cessation of feeling and perception, entered the sphere of neither perception no non-perception. From that he entered the sphere of nothingness, the sphere of infinite consciousness, the sphere of infinite space. From the sphere of infinite space he entered the fourth jhana, from there the third, the second and the first jhana. Leaving the first jhana he entered the second, the third, the fourth jhana and leaving the fourth jhana the Lord finally passed away. And at the blessed Lord final passing there was a great earthquake terrible, hair-raising, accompanied by thunder and Brahma Sahampati uttered this verse. All beings in the world, all bodies must break up. Even the teacher, 
peerless in the human world the mighty lord and perfect buddha passed away and sakka rule of the devas uttered this verse impermanent are compounded things prone to rise and fall having risen they are destroyed they are passing through as bliss and the venerable anurudh uttered this verse no breathing in and out just with steadfast heart the sage who free from lust has passed away to peace with mind unshaken he endured all pains by nibbana the illuminated mind is freed and the venerable anurudh uttered this verse terrible was the quaking men saw stood on end when all accomplished buddha passed away and those monks who had not yet overcome their passion wept and tore their hair raising their arms throwing themselves down and twisting and turning crying all too soon the blessed lord has passed away all too soon welfare has passed away all too soon the eye of the world has disappeared but those monks who were free from craving enjoyed mindfully and clearly were saying all compounded things are impermanent what is the use of this when the venerable anurudh said friends enough of your weeping and wailing has not the lord already told you that all things that are pleasant and delightful are changeable subject to separation and to becoming other so why all these friends whatever is born become compounded is subject to decay it cannot be that it does not decay the devas friends are grumbling venerable anurudh what kind of devas are you aware of friend anand there are sky devas whose minds are earth bound they are weeping and tearing their hair and there are earth devas whose minds are earth bound they do likewise but those devas who are free from craving and you are patiently saying all compounded are impermanent what is the use of this then the venerable anurudh and the venerable anand spent the rest of the night in conversation on dhamma and the venerable anurudh said now go friend anand to kusinara and announce the mallas vasit is the lord has passed away now is the time to do you think fit yes lord said anand and having dressed in the morning and taken his robe and bowl he went with a companion to kusinara at the time the mallas of kusinara were assembled in their meeting hall on some business and the venerable anand came to them and delivered the venerable anurudh's message and when they heard the venerable anand's word the mallas were struck with anguish and sorrow their minds were overcome with grief so that they were all tearing their hair then the mallas ordered their men to bring perfume and wreaths and gather all musicians together and with the perfumes and wreaths and all musicians and with 500 set of garments they went to the sagro where the lord's body was lying and they honored paid respect worshiped and adored the lord's body with dance and song and music with garlands and saints making owning and a circular tents in order to spend the day there and they thought it is too late to cremate the lord's body today we shall do so tomorrow and so paying homage in the same way the waited for the second a third a fourth and fifth a sixth day and on the seventh day the mallas of kusinara thought we have paid sufficient honor with song and dance to lord's body now we shall burn his body after carrying him out of the south gate then the eight mallas chiefs having washed their heads and put on new clothes declared now we will lift up the lord's body but found they were unable to do so so they went to the venerable anurudh and told him what has happened why can't we lift up the lord's body vasatis your intention is one thing but the intention of the devas is another lord what is the intention of devas vasatis your intention is having paid homage to lord's body with dance and songs to burn his body after carrying him out of the south gate but the devas intention is having paid homage to the lord's body with heavenly dance and song to carry him to the north of the city bring him through the north gate and bear him through the middle of the city and out to the eastern gate to the mall shrine of makutbandana and there to burn the body lord if that is the devas intention so be it 
At that time, even the savers and rubbish heaps of Kuzinara were covered knee high with coral tree flowers. And the devas, as well as mullers of Kuzinara, honored the Lord's body with divine and human dancing songs. And they carried the body to the north of the city, bore it into the north gate, to the middle of the city, and out through the eastern gate to the mullers shrine of Makutabandana, where they set the body down. Then they asked about Venerable Ananda. Lord, how should we deal with the body of Tathagata? Vasettas, you should deal with the Tathagata's body as you would that of a wheel-turning monarch. And how do they deal with that load? Vasettas, the remains are wrapped in new linen cloth. This they wrap in a teased cotton wool. Then having a funeral fire of all manner of perfumes, they cremate the king's body and they raise a stoop at the crossroads. Then the mullers ordered their men to bring their teased cotton wool and they dealt with the Tathagata's body accordingly. Now just when the venerable Kasapa the Great was travelling along the main road from Pawa to Kuzinara with a large company of about 500 monks, and leaving the road, the venerable Kasapa the Great sat down under a tree, and a certain Arjavika chanced to be becoming along the main road towards Pawa, and he had picked a coral tree flower in Kuzinara. The venerable Kasapa saw him coming from afar, and said to him, Friend, do you know our teacher? Yes, friend, I do. The ascetic Gautama passed away a week ago. I picked this coral tree flower there. And those monks who had not yet overcome their passion wept and tore their hair. But those monks who were free from craving enjoyed mindfully and clearly were saying, All compounded things are impermanent. What is the use of this? And sitting in the group was one Subhadda who had gone forth late in life and said to those monks, Enough friends, don't weep and wail. We are well rid of the great ascetic. We were always bothered by his saying, It is fitting for you to do this. It is not fitting for you to do this. Now we can do what we like and not to do what we don't like. But the venerable Kastava the Great said to the monks, Friends, enough of your weeping and wailing. Has not the Lord already told you that all things are pleasant and delightful are changeable, subject to separation and becoming other. So why all these friends? Whatever is born, become, compounded, is all subject to decay. It cannot be that it does not be decay. Meanwhile, four Malla chiefs, having washed their heads and put on new clothes, said, We will light the Lord's funeral pyre. But they were unable to do so. They went to the venerable Anruddha and asked him why this was. Vasettas, your intention is one thing, but that of the devas is another. Well, Lord, what is the intention of devas? Vasettas, the devas' intention is this. The venerable Kasapa the Great is coming along the main road from Pawa to Kuzinara with a large company of 500 monks. The Lord's funeral pyre will not be lit until the venerable Kasapa the Great has paid homage with his head to the Lord's feet. Lord, if that is the Deva's intention, so be it. Then the venerable Kasapa the Great went to the Malla shrine of Makutabandana to the Lord's funeral fire and covering one shoulder with his robe, joined his hands in salutation, circumambulated the fire three times and uncovering the Lord's feet, paid homage with his head to them, and five hundred monks did likewise. And when this was done, the Lord's funeral fire ignited of itself. And when the Lord's body was burned, what had been skin, under skin, flesh, snews, or joint fluid, all that vanished and not even ashes or dust remained, only the bones remained. Just as when butter or oil is burned, no ashes or dust remains, so it was with the Lord's body, only the bones were left. And all the five hundred garments, even the innermost and the outmost clothes, were burnt up. And when the Lord's body was burnt up, a shower of water from the sky, another which burst forth from Sahal tree, extinguished the funeral fire. And the mullahs of Kuznara poured perfumed water over it for the same purpose. Then the mullahs honoured the relics for a week in their assembly hall. Having made a lattice work of spears and encircling walls of boughs, with dancing, 
singing garlands and music. And King Aja sat to where the Hiput of Magad heard that the Lord has passed away at Kozinara. And he sent a message to the Mallas of Kozinara. The Lord was a Khatiye and I am a Khatiye. I am worthy to receive a share of Lord's remains. I will make a great stoop for them. The Lichavis of Vesali heard and they sent a message. The Lord was Khatiye and we were Khatiyas. We are worthy to receive a share of Lord's remains. And we will make a great stupor for them. The Sarkas of Kapilavatu heard and they sent a message. The Lord was the chief of our clan. We are worthy to receive the share of Lord's remains and we will make a great stupor for them. The Bulayas of Alakapa and the Koliyas of Ramagama replied similarly. The Brahmin of Vetadipa heard and he sent a message. The Lord was a Khatiya. I am a Brahmin. And the Mullahs of Fawa sent a message. The Lord was a Khatiya, we are Khatiyas, we are worthy of receiving a share of Lord's remains and we will make a great stoop for them. On hearing all this, the Mallas of Kozinara addressed the crowd saying, The Lord is passing away in our parish, we will not give away any share of the Lord's remains. At this the Braf and Dona addressed the crowd in this verse, Listen Lords to my proposal. Forbearance is the Buddha's teaching. It is not right that strife should come from sharing out the best of the men's remaining. Let's all be joined in harmony and peace, in friendship sharing out portions eight. Let super far and wide be put up, that all may see and gain in faith. Well, Brahmin, you divide up the remains of the lords in the best and fairest way. Very good friend, said the owner. And he made a good and fair division into eight portions and then said to the assembly, Gentlemen, please give me the urn and I will erect a great stupa for it. So they gave Dona the urn. Now the Mauryans of Fifalavana heard the Lord's passing and they sent a message. The Lord was Khatti and we are Khattis. We are worthy to receive a portion of Lord's remaining and we will make a great stupa for them. There is not a portion for the Lord's remain left. They have been all divided up. So you must take the embers. And so they took the embers. The king Adasattu of Magadh built a great stupa for the Lord's relics at Rajgah. The Litavi of Vesali built one at Vesali. The Sarkens of Kapilavatu built one at Kapilavatu. The Bulyas of Alakapa built one at Alakapa. The Koliyas of Rajagama built one at Rajagama. The Brahmin of Vetadipa built one at Vetadipa. The Mallas of Pawa built one at Pawa. The Mallas of Kuzinara built a great stupa for the Lord relics at Kuzinara. The Brahmin Dona built a great stupa for the urn. And the Mauryas of Pipulivana built a great stupa for the embers at the Pipulivana. Thus, eight stupas were built for the relics, a nine for the urn, and a tenth for the embers. That is how it was in the old days. Eight portions of relics there were of him, the all seeing one. Of these, Seven remained in Jambudipa with honor, the eighth in Rajagama kept by Naga kings. The two, the thirty golds have kept, Kalinga's king have won, the Nagas too. They shed their glory over the fruitful earth. Thus the seer honored by the honored, golds and Nagas, kings, the noblest men, claps their hands in homage, for hard it is to find other such of countless eons.